The end of August is here, but it's only the beginning of this episode of the Paperback Warrior Podcast. Welcome back to the Paperback Warrior Podcast. My name is Eric, and I'm going to introduce my broadcast partner, Tom, in just a moment. Paperback Warrior is the Internet's finest source of news and reviews for vintage fiction and the hard-boiled crime, spy, western, and men's adventure genres. We've got a blog at paperbackwarrior.com, where all of our content is always free. You can also join the conversation by following Paperback Warrior on Facebook, where we post photos of all these paperbacks we discuss. Let me introduce Tom, who's going to tell us what's happening this week. Thank you, Eric. Today's feature is about a terrific uh, crime and police fiction author that I'm excited to tell you more about. His name is William P. McGivern. And in the body of that feature, both you and I are going to review some of McGivern books that we've read and enjoyed. But my featured review of the week is actually a 1959 ace double called The Guilty Bystander by a guy named Mike Brett. What are you going to be reviewing? I should probably know this, but I don't. Dovetailing off your feature, I'm going to do... Uh, 1957 book by William P. McGivern called Night Extra. Oh, good. That ties together quite nicely. It does. I want to know what that sea of yellow spines there uh, is all about. Yes. There's a company in Medford, Oregon called Sinister Cinema that sells DVDs of obscure classic genre films. I get the impression that the DVDs are their main business, but the guy who owns the company is named Greg Luce. And he has another company called Armchair Fiction that reprints old crime and science fiction novels from the 1950s and 1960s as modern paperbacks while preserving the original cover art as much as possible. Now, their website is armchairfiction.com. Now, most of their reprint library are packaged like ace doubles with two books in one volume uh, with a front cover on each side. Now, unlike Ace Doubles, they don't do an upside-down printing for the B-side, so it's really more like a Stark House double where 50% of the paperback um, you know, is one book and then the second half right. of the, is another one. So Armchair Fiction has been lovingly mimicking the color schemes from their Ace Doubles in the creation of their reprints. So their crime doubles are packaged with yellow and red spines, and their science fiction doubles are with blue and red spines. Aesthetically, they're incredibly eye-catching addition to your library if you shelve them all next to each other like I do. Now, one downside of armchair fiction for some people is that all of the reprints are the larger trade paperbacks and not the smaller mass market paperbacks that you and I really enjoy. The upside is that the fonts are a bit bigger than they would be otherwise, so it's a little easier on the eyes for old guys like me. Now, most of these reprint houses produce their reprints through a fairly mechanical process. They get an old paperback that they've either acquired the rights to from the author's estate or they find a book that's fallen into public domain. And they actually destroy the old paperback by removing the pages from the spine. And then they feed the old paperback through a computer scanner. So the image of each page is basically sequentially photographed. There's software called Optical Character Recognition Software that recognizes the letter in the page and converts them from a photograph of words on a page into basically a live word processing document. The problem is that the software is super imperfect, and it misreads letters all the time. So the, if, so the book can be a bit of a mess if all you're doing is scanning the old book into the software. So in, you know, a mustard stain from 1959 on page 150 could be <laughs> misinterpreted by the software as being a very graphic reference to one's private parts, for example. Oh. So the trick is to have an actual person go through the manuscript and make corrections to clean up those errors. Now, the best reprint houses out there like Stark House or Hard Case Crime really take their time getting it right and fixing those typos. So their end product is nearly perfect. Other places do a little less care, and you get a lot of typos from the OCR software and kind of lazy editing. So some people I know actually do this as a hobby, where they take books apart, and they make Kindle books out of orphaned works, and they put them up on their blogs for readers to enjoy. I looked into it to my, myself just out of curiosity and found that there's actually companies in India who will rip apart your paperback, scan it, and send you an ebook of it for a fee. All this brings back me back to this armchair fiction company. I don't know this guy, Greg Luce, or what his production process is, but I have a theory 
that armchair fiction is not, in fact, using optical character recognition to make their trade paperback reprints. I believe that armchair fiction has a flesh-and-blood typist Hmm. who is retyping the entire manuscript of these novels directly into a word processing program. I also believe, Eric, that the typist is a Roman Catholic (laughs) senior citizen. How can you know that? Elementary, my dear Watson. (laughs) I use the science of deduction to figure this out. Now, I've read several armchair fiction mystery crime classics, And like I said before, they're beautifully laid out, and I've yet to find a single typo in any of their books. But they all have one thing in common, Eric. They all have two spaces after the period at the end of each sentence. Now, this, of course, is how Catholic nuns, Uh, the nuns taught the youth how to type on manual and electric typewriters before there was such a thing as word processors. Now, word processing software has eliminated the need for this, but you can always tell a typist taught by nuns because they still do this into Microsoft Word. Now, this is a huge pet peeve for my wife, and she writes resumes for a living, and she goes bananas anytime she sees two spaces after a period. You know how a lot of women have, like, pet causes, like end human sex trafficking or end (laughs) childhood obesity or childhood leukemia? Yeah. Yeah. My wife's cause is no two spaces after a period. And it's largely the reason I haven't run for president because she would insist that that be the cornerstone of my campaign. And candidly, it doesn't really bother me a bit. (laughs) Is this a hill that you would die on, Eric? What do you think about the two spaces after a period? Uh, First off, I didn't realize that two spaces after the period could be linked back to Catholic school. Um, I, I honestly can't even read literature or emails or really anything that has that pattern. Oh, really? So it bugs you, too? It, you know, it drives me crazy. Okay, well, then armchair fiction may not be for you. <laughs> now, even if armchair fiction ever reaches into romance fiction, my bride will want to stay away from them because this will make her crazy. So I don't know if they have a single retiree typing these books for them or if armchair fiction has an entire sweatshop of senior citizens chained to their desks with oxygen and pericomo music being pumped into a workroom. If Greg Luce or his excellent assistant, Mo, want to fess up and tell me how they produce these awesome reprints, I'm all ears. Well, tell me about the books that you did get from them. Okay, so most of the books they reprint were once ace doubles, but they always try to match their own doubles with a novel other than what it was originally paired with. Uh, Lately, the imprint has broadened their horizons to include reprints from graphic books and even some Fawcett Gold Medals, including The Judas Hour by E. Howard Hunt. We did an episode on Howard Hunt the other day. Yeah. Now, some armchair fiction books are single novels, and some are doubles. Now, each trade paperback, whether it's a single or a double, costs $12.95, but here's the trick. Several times per year, they have a sale of $98 for 10 books. So it's called about $10 per book. But if you choose double novels, then you're bringing the price down to $5 a book, which is very reasonable for a new reprint. Uh, The good thing is that they're rolling out new titles all the time. And uh, and I guess their little old lady typing pool is working a lot of overtime lately. Um, so I just got a 10-pack of books for $98, and I'll post photos online of them. But let me tell you some of the highlights. I don't want to go through all 10 books. I got a single novel. I'm going to hand this over to you called Empire of Evil. Oh, interesting. I've been looking for this book. Okay, well, you can borrow mine if you want. It's by Sterling Noel. Uh, It was originally written in 1961. Uh, It was an Avon Books release. It seems that there is a bit of a feeding frenzy going on right now to reprint Sterling Noel's entire back catalog. I think both Cutting Edge Books and Wild Side Press have both reprinted some of his stuff. Now, you've read and liked uh, Sterling Noel's books, uh, haven't you? Yes, I have. I've got a few um, reviews on on the blog. Okay. This one's about the son of a mafia godfather who's prepping to inherit his father's control of the mafia. Meanwhile, he's also a trained counter-assassin for a secret government agency. Maybe it's not a government agency, but a secret agency known only as FANG, F-A-N-G. The book is, again, Empire of Evil by Sterling Noel. Now, one nice thing that Armchair Fiction does is that they include their own character list at the beginning of each novel, if you take a look at there. Now, it's, mm. they do that whether the original book has it or not. 
Now, I don't really love this practice uh, because they run the risk of actually spoiling a plot point by telling me that a character is more significant than they may let on at the beginning. So I actually try to avoid reading those. Do you like those character lists at the beginning of these old novels? What I do is when I'm looking for a book to read and I open it and it has a character list, I put the book back on the shelf because I don't like all those characters. But, usually because it has too many characters? But, but it's probably just, this, just like a regular book. I'm just looking at a list of characters and saying, I don't want to read it. Yeah, well, yeah you, Or you could do what I do and just skip that page. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> That's what I should do. All right. So the next one I want to showcase is, let me hand this over to you. Oh, oh here it is. This one's called Murder Has Many Faces by William O'Farrell. What's interesting about this one is that it was originally released in 1955 by Graphic Books under the pseudonym of William Grew, G-R-E-W. But Armchair Fiction used the original cover art while restoring the author's name to his actual name of O'Farrell. Now, O'Farrell was a screenwriter for the Perry Mason TV show, the original one, not the new HBO one, and Alfred Hitchcock presents in the early days of television. The plot seems rather standard. Uh, Nick returns home to patch things up with his estranged brother. The brother gets murdered, and Nick needs to solve the murder to clear his own name. Tale as old as time, right? O'Farrell is pretty good, and um, and these TV writer guys generally know how to keep a story moving, so... I'm going to check that one out again. It's called Murder Has Many Faces by William O'Farrell. The next armchair book I want to hand over here is, I bought in this 10-pack. It's called A Time for Murder by our old buddy Milton Ozaki. Oh, yeah. You love this guy. We did an entire feature on Mil- Milton Ozaki that you should check out in our archives. He led a pretty wild life running mail order scams. Right. <laughs> Um, this book is uh, ha- was a graphic books release from 1956, originally written under Ozaki's popular pseudonym of Robert Saber. Armchair Fiction's reprint is under the Ozaki name. Anyway, it's the second of two novels starring hard-boiled private eye Max Keen, who gets tied up with a crooked cop. One thing I like about Ozaki is that he's a Chicago guy like me, and he does a very nice job of making Chicago come alive in his books. Again, that one's called A Time for Murder by Milton Ozaki. And the last book I want to hype, and you got to take, you got to, you're gonna love this cover. It's called Man Bait oh, wow. by Jack Liston. Take a look at that cover art. Isn't that something? That's uh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so Man Bait was originally a Dell release from 1960. Now the author Jack Liston is a pseudonym for a guy named Ralph Maloney, and if it's the same guy I researched, he was a Long Island, New York guy. He served as a merchant marine in World War II and was an army lieutenant in the early 1950s after graduating from Harvard in 1951. He was a mainstream author of novels including The Nixon Recession Caper, The 24-Hour Drink Book, Daily Bread, and The Great Boniker Whiskey War. He died in 1973 at age 46. Anyway, that book in your hand, A Man Bait, was published under the Jack Liston pseudonym. It's about a sailor recovering from gonorrhea (laughs) who becomes mixed up with a girl who lures him into a gambling scam. I read the first couple pages, and the first-person narration is just awesome. So look for a review soon. I'm going to check that one out. It's called Man Bait by Jack Liston. Anyway, you can check out the entire catalog of trade paperback uh, reprints at armchairfiction.com. If you order from them, please tell them that you heard about them on the Paperback Warrior podcast. I think most, if not all, of their books are also available through Amazon, but then you lose that 10 for $98 deal that we talked about. They don't seem to have much of their library available on Kindle yet. I don't really understand that. There must be a reason, but I don't get it because the sales margin for an ebook have to be way more. Uh, once you get that little old lady to retype the book, um, it's great, but you know, it's not my problem. How much is shipping? Free. Free shipping. I think. I think so free. Those are and, heavy. Yeah. One, here's a pro tip. If you call them, they have, they have like a 1-800 number. You can place your order on the phone and not on the online, which actually is kind of easier if you're doing the $98 deal. And they have the world's greatest customer service lady. Her name's Mo. I don't know if it's short <laughs> for Moesha or Maureen. Right. Um, and she sounds like she's amazing looking. And she's so, so nice on the phone. It's like, mm. like I just wanted to keep giving her money. She was so good. <laughs> whatever that Greg Luce guy is paying that wow. Mo lady, uh, maybe his wife or his daughter or his sister or whatever, but she's amazing. Yeah. And so uh, if I had any kind of company, I would double her salary just to <laughs> hire her away from Greg because yeah. she's really good on the phone. Sounds amazing. All right, cool. You had something you want to talk about. Yeah, I was going to say, do you mind if I uh, take a second to plug a book that uh, Paperback Warriors uh, written all over. Yeah, go for it. All right, cool. 
Uh, so I'm actually just looking at this for the first time. So a few months back, uh, we announced that uh, we were invited, uh, Paperback Warrior was invited to collaborate with editor Justin Marriott for a new book showcasing post-apocalyptic novels from the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And lo and behold, after all these, uh, well, I guess not really after all these months, after summer months, we finally have Pulp Apocalypse. And man, it's got a great cover, and I'm kind of thumbing through it now. Here's what you get. Uh, this is out now, but you get a look at uh, bikers in post-apocalyptic men's adventure fiction. Uh, you've got uh, an interview with Lawrence James about the Deathland series. Uh, you've got a look at Jan Stacy, who wrote uh, Doomsday series, uh, Doomsday Warrior series, and The Last Ranger. Uh, David Robbins is talking about In World. Uh, you've got David Alexander uh, talking about the Phoenix series, and then you've got uh, Jim Cobb, uh, who's a, a, pr- a professional prepper. Uh, he's got a, a little article in here about uh, what uh, kind of inspired him. But looking at the reviews, uh, boy, they just go on and on. You've got death, five books of Deathlands, uh, three books of Survival 2000. You've got uh, Biker Reviews, The Lost Traveler, Damnation Alley, The Death of Grass, The Iron Dream. You've got Doomsday Warrior 1. You've got all the Last Ranger books, I believe, in here. Uh, the In-World books, the Blade books. You've got comic books, Young Adult. And you've got The Survivalist, Out of the Ashes. Freedom Rangers, all the ones that you'd expect, and there's a lot of new ones in here that I don't recognize. If you are a fan of post-apocalyptic <laughs> fiction, you must own this book. It is the yeah. ultimate reference and buyer's guide for that genre. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, but it's out now, uh, so be sure to pick up a copy. All right, t- tell them the title again and uh, and where they can get it. Uh, Pulp Apocalypse, uh, and this is available on Amazon. And I think it's like seven bucks, maybe. Yeah, it's cheap, and uh, they and I think if you looked under Justin Marriott's name, he puts himself down as the author, although he's really more of the editor. Um, and you got a bunch of stuff in there, right? You keep referring to Paperback Warrior. I did not lift a finger on this. <laughs> yeah, I think I've got maybe 15, 16 reviews in here, and uh, I was uh, honored that he asked me to do the forward on it. So Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, yeah. it's, it's just a great reference guide, and the price is right. I don't know how he uh, makes any money and, and affords to live in a, a giant Br- British castle <laughs> in, in right. outside of London, but... Everything Justin Marriott turns turns to go uh, touches turns to gold. That guy's really good at what he does. Yeah, and he said he's got uh, some stuff in the works for uh, World War II um, uh, themed books. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm, I may be able to contribute to that. I got a yeah. couple books uh, in our uh, review archives. I'm happy to give to over to him. So, uh, you ready for a feature? Yes. Transition music, please. Our feature today is about an author named William P. McGivern. He was born in Chicago in 1922, but at a young age, his family moved to Mobile, Alabama, where he was raised. His dad was a farmer, and his mom was a dressmaker. He was a high school dropout, but he loved to read as a teenager. His favorite authors were Nathaniel Hawthorne, Ernest Hemingway, and William Faulkner. He worked for the Pullman Company, a big manufacturer of rail cars, and somewhere in there he also took classes at the University of Birmingham. He sold his first short story to the pulp magazine Amazing Stories in 1940 and continued to sell short stories throughout his entire career to magazines including the Saturday Evening Post, Collier's, and Cosmopolitan. Now, during the pulp magazine era, his bread and butter was really science fiction stories. I've never read any of his fantasy or science fiction works, but Wild Side Press has compiled 50 of his stories into two volumes. They're like 99 cents each on Kindle. So like a lot of these guys that we cover on the show, he joined the U.S. Army in 1943 and rose to the rank of line sergeant. At one point, he was aboard a tanker that was being bombed. He exercised some some very quick thinking, and McGivern opened the valves and released the explosive gas from the tanker, which saved the entire crew who who were trapped on board. And for that, he received the prestigious Soldier's Medal, and he left the Army in 1946. So after the Army, McGivern landed a job, and I think this is significant, as a police reporter with the Philadelphia Inquirer, which touched off his fascination with police work and police culture, and really a theme that ran through his 23 mystery novels. He worked as a police reporter for two years, and then he jumped ship to become a regular reporter and a reviewer for the Philadelphia Evening Bulletin. And it was while he was working as a reporter that his first novel was published in 1948. It was called But Death Runs Faster. 
And when paperbacks took off in 1950, that novel was then reprinted as a paperback under the name The Whispering Corpse in 1950. So 1948, that was a big year for McGivern for another reason, because that was the year that he married Margaret Daly, who then became, became Margaret McGivern. Now, she was also a journalist and a published author herself with a 1942 bestseller called 17th Summer. Have you read that one, Eric? No, I haven't. Is it under Margaret McGivern or is it Daly? I think it's Margaret Daly. Okay. No, I haven't. Uh, me neither. Anyway, Margaret and William collaborated on a handful of non-genre books throughout their lives, including a non-fiction book about their world travels. So as we talk about every week, it seems, McGivern's career as a crime novelist went bananas in the 1950s when paperback original novels became all the rage. Between 1950 and 1960, he had 13 popular paperbacks published. And I want to walk through some of the highlights. I'm going to hand this one to you. This is uh, my favorite book of his. It's a 1954 book called Rogue Cop. Now, the book's protagonist is Detective Sergeant Mike Carmody, a police officer in the employ of his big city police department. He doesn't say it's Philadelphia, but it feels like Philadelphia. And um, Mike Carmody is also a dirty cop. He also works uh, for money on the side with the local mobster, a guy named Dan. And now Carmody has this idealistic kid brother named Eddie, who's also a cop. So you got the dirty cop and the clean cop. And, uh, but the kid brother, Eddie, he honors his oath of office, always plays by the rules. As you can imagine, their relationship is distant and chilly due to the sizable gulf between their core values, because you got a dirty cop brother and a clean cop brother. The older, crooked Carmody has this real dilemma on his hands because his brother, Eddie, is preparing to testify against a low-level mobster. And the godfather that the older brother works for is nervous that the defendant's going to flip and if, conv- in, if convicted. And so the mobster asks Carmody's help to have his kid brother, Eddie, keep his mouth shut or else. Right? So you've got the, the dirty brother trying to put pressure on the clean brother to not testify against a mar- uh, mobster. Right. So when Carmody explains the risks of testifying to his kid brother, Eddie, the super Catholic younger brother doesn't want to hear it and uh, can, he can't be bought or swayed. So Carmody is forced into quite a bit of soul searching regarding his own reputation in the department as a dirty cop while devising a plan to placate his mob boss and keep his kid brother alive. Guys, listener and Eric, this is a fantastic novel. McGivern really brings his A game when it comes to creating tension and making Carmody's redemption tale just this roller coaster ride of conflicting interests. The mobsters are incredibly menacing, but they're never cartoonish. And the scenes of reckoning between the brothers are, are genuinely emotionally wrenching. McGivern has this real knack for propulsive plotting, and the story is just tight as a drum. Rogue Cop is more than just a kick-ass tale of cops and crooks, although there's plenty of asses that do get kicked. It's also a story of a man really fighting for his own redemption, professionally, spiritually, in every aspect. There's a lot going on in this short novel, and it's just way smarter than most paperbacks I, I read. Um, the book was adapted that same year into a well-regarded movie starring Robert Taylor and Janet Lee before she starred in Psycho. I haven't seen the movie adaptation because they always seem to be a letdown. But uh, you shouldn't cheat yourself out of a great page turner. If you're looking for a fast-moving, hard-boiled crime story without an ounce of fat, you should definitely check out Rogue Cop by William McGivern. Uh, it's just essential reading. It's highly recommended. Now, later in the show, Eric, you're going to be reviewing McGivern's 1957 novel, Night Extra. But he had another release in 1957 called Odds Against Tomorrow that I want to tell you about, okay? So this is a Odds Against Tomorrow is a classic heist thriller. You know I love heist books. Yeah. But there's this interpersonal twist in it. It stars this guy, Earl Slater. He's a Texas ex-con who reluctantly joins a four-man crew planning a bank robbery, and he guesses that the take's going to be about two hundred grand. The catch is that the outfit's fourth man is a black guy, nice guy named John Ingram. They made a movie of this, and it was actually played, uh, Harry Belafonte hmm. uh, played John Ingram in the 1959 film adaptation. And er- Earl Slater, the Texas ex-con who's sort of like leading the crew, he's, he's like a super racist. And, uh, oh, and but he's got a black guy in his crew, yeah. and so uh, the question, you know, is can he set aside his prejudices for the greater good of the plan to make this heist work? And so the man with the plan for this uh, bank job is this ex-cop turned crook named Dave Burke, who's also part of the crew, and he's thought of everything. He's this con- he's the consummate professional. Think of him like like Parker in the Stark books, and all he's got to do is convince this four man crew to stick together with this 
foolproof plan he's developed and convince Slater to set his bigotry aside for the dura- for the good of the job. And if you've ever read a heist novel, you can guess that things go sideways pretty poorly and that no plan is truly foolproof. Now, McGivern does a fantastic job of introducing us to the key members of this heist crew, their backgrounds, their motivations. The flashbacks and exposition happen fast, and it never diminishes from the excitement of the planning of the heist and their getaway. Now, the scenes depicting the canny local sheriff who senses that trouble is brewing are also terrific, and they really bring the will-they-get-away-with-it pot to this rolling boil. Some of the post-heist sequences, I thought, in this book dragged a little bit, but the conclusion landed on solid ground. Fans of heist paperbacks um, would uh, rightly cite like Lionel White and Richard Stark as kind of the high watermarks of the genre. But I would say that Odds Against Tomorrow, although it doesn't quite reach those heights, it's definitely worthwhile and worth reading. And I definitely recommend it. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. So again, it's called Odds Against Tomorrow by William McGivern. Now, the only pseudonym novel I'm aware that he ever wrote was a private eye book called Blondes Die Young from 1952 written under the name of Bill Peters, which is just a variation on his first and middle name. I think some of his pulp magazine stories may have been published under pseudonyms, and that's often because uh, he had more than one story in a single issue. Now, I reviewed a book uh, that he wrote. It's really more of a a novella, and I'm going to hand this across to you. It's called Killer on the Turnpike. It's actually a 63-page story by William McGivern that was originally serialized in the Saturday Evening Post in 1961 under the title Murder on the Turnpike. And the paperback I handed you is a is a bunch of McGivern short stories kind of anchored by that 63-page uh, novella at the beginning. Um, and uh, the, What You Have in Your Hands was released by Pocket Books in 1961. And the story was actually collected in the Alfred Hitchcock compilation, Stories to be Read with the Lights On, from 1973, if some of our listeners have that. Anyway, Killer on the Turnpike takes place over a single night when a serial killer, and this was before they had a term for a serial killer, is stalking, abducting, and killing motorists along a 100-mile stretch of an interstate highway stretching south from New York. Now, the state troopers patrolling the turnpike first notice an abandoned car, followed by a dead body, with more mayhem to follow. Even still, it takes them a while to piece together what exactly what's happening. Now, adding to the tension of the serial killer is the fact that 45 miles of this highway are going to be traveled by the motorcade of the President of the United States later that night. Hmm. So there's a state trooper who discovers uh, the abandoned car 200 yards away from a highway uh, diner where his girlfriend works, and he ends up spearheading the cat and mouse game between the police and the killer that is really the centerpiece of this uh, long story or short novel. McGivern writes tense suspense uh, scenes as well as logical police procedural passages very well. The scenes jump from the killer to the police with very smooth transitions. I think it stretched my realism a little bit that the president's convoy isn't just rerouted while there's an active manhunt on the turnpike for a serial killer. <laughs> right. But I guess what fun would that be? Uh, killer on the turnpike is a fun way to kill some time with, with an old crumbling paperback. I wouldn't spend a fortune on it, but um, but if you read it, you're not going to be let down. And I recommend it. Um, it also became a movie called Nightmare in Chicago, directed by Robert Altman in 1964, featuring an actor named Charles McGraw. Now, Hollywood really liked William McGivern's books, and 14 of his 23 novels were actually made into movies. That's remarkable. The Big Heat, one of his books, received an Edgar Award in 1954 as the best motion picture, and the rules of the Edgar Awards that McGivern shares that as the author of the original novel. Mm. In the early 1960s, McGivern moved to Los Angeles to write for film and television. He wrote TV series including Ben Casey, Adam 12, and Kojak. It's certainly nothing to brag about, Eric, but McGivern wrote the screenplay for the Matt Helm movie, The Wrecking Crew, Mm. starring Dean Martin and Sharon Tate, which is very loosely based on the novel by Donald Hamilton. Now, the movie really sucked, but I'm sure the paycheck cleared. Now, McGivern continued writing novels through the 1960s, and they took on international settings as the author and his wife became well-traveled themselves. His last crime novel was called Night of the Juggler in 1975. Thereafter, he wrote a handful of novels with his wife. My instinct is that they're probably more her books than his, but who knows. After finding a robust career in California, the couple stayed there until McGivern died from cancer in 1982 in Palm Desert, California. 
His books are largely out of print, with only a couple available on, in Kindle format. However, I see them in used bookstores all the time, so you probably won't, you'll probably be able to find them. Many of his books have been adapted into audiobooks, so that's also an option if you want to check out McGivern's work. Before I throw it over to you, Eric, uh, for your McGivern review, I want to acknowledge the writers I used uh, and researchers who gave me the info uh, for this segment. I used Brian Ritt's book, Paperback Confidential. I also use the Fantastic Fiction website, Wikipedia, and the New York Times obituary. And also a really good website I found called Speedy Mystery. So uh, since we have William McGivern fresh in our minds, why don't you just tell us about the one that you read and reviewed? Yeah, so I did, uh, I'm doing a book called Night Extra, which was my first experience with the author. It was published by Pocket in 1957. McGivern's experience as a journalist, I think, clearly played a large influence on the narrative and some of the plot points. The book's hero is newspaper reporter Sam Terrell. And while working the Night Extra, which um, uh, back in the day it was a special late evening edition of the newspaper, which, which just basically recapped a lot of important events, but Terrell receives a tip that Richard Caldwell, who's a white hat candidate for mayor, may be having an affair with a mob kingpin's girl. After interviewing the girl, Terrell learns that she has secretly relayed some mob details to Caldwell in hopes that he can use it to win the election. However, hours later, it's reported on the police scanner that the girl has been found dead in Caldwell's apartment. Terrell thinks it's a frame job, and he can validate it with an eyewitness that says the killer wasn't Caldwell. When his sources are questioned, his story is buried, so Terrell sets out to set the record straight for the public. Like any hardboard crime fiction protagonist, Terrell interviews key witnesses. He participates in the shakedown on uh, the unnamed city's corruption. McGivern's contemporary, author David Alexandra, uh, different from the author of the same name who wrote the Phoenix series, but David Alexander utilized the same formula for his eight-book series starring Broadway Times reporter Bart Hardin. That ran 1954 to 1959. Other authors like Richard Sale and Frederick Brown also wrote short stories starring news hounds that worked like private eyes to break or solve murder cases. McGivern's position is that his hero is there to crack the case, but he stacks the deck with crooked cops and politicians for the hero to combat. The author adds some social commentary on the media's ability to sway voters with their story, which I thought was an ethical message that's probably still pretty prevalent today. Definitely. Night Extra doesn't reinvent the hardboard formula, uh, but the author certainly showcases his talents and strengths in perfecting it. This was a really fast-paced narrative, and it had a lot of touching characters, which I was invested into. Uh, I'm not sure if Terrell was a recurring character in any of McEvern's other novels. If he wasn't, I felt like he should have been. But this book was great. I, re- I really recommend it. That sounds great. I, I don't think he had any series characters. No, I, I, I guess unless there's just one or two that appeared in multiple novels. But I, he's not a guy that's ever cited as being a series author. Yeah, well, this got, you know, got me thinking about um, series heroes that were reporters. Let me think. Okay, we got Fletch, of course, by Gregory MacDonald, uh, which actually started me in the crime fiction and mystery genre. And I see that they're rebooting the film series starring John Hamm, uh, who played Don Draper in Mad Men. That could be good. Yeah. Uh, So we got uh, James A. Howard wrote a fantastic series of novels starring starring a reporter named Steve Ash. And those books have been reprinted by Cutting Edge Books as e-books and new edition paperbacks. The series went uh, four installments between 54 and 57, and it stars a rough-and-ready pilot boxer reporter who's unafraid to fight dirty. There was that series, and you and I both looked at these, uh, the the Dreadful (laughs) Hawk series starring Dan Stribe. Just great covers, but not worth the paper they're written on. What do you got? You got any uh, journalists as heroes? Well, you know, I was researching, and I saw saw this the other day. Uh, Richard Sale, uh, he had an early wisecracking reporter as a hero. Uh, his name was Joe Daffy Dill, and he worked for the New York Chronicle. He appeared in over 50 short stories for Detective Fiction, uh, Detective Fiction Pulp Magazine in the 1930s and 40s. But if anyone wants to take a really deep dive on this news hound sort of private eye genre, check out thrillingdetective.com. Search for their section called Stop the Press's uh, Newsroom Eyes. It's really an incredible collection of authors and characters. That's cool. So um, I'm going to close out the show with a review of half of an armchair fiction double that I recently finished, but there's a little confusion in it. Last week, you mentioned an author named Michael Brett. Oh, yeah. Who wrote a book called Diecast. I'm going to hand this across. Do you, do you have a copy of this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's Diecast by Michael Brett. And I'm going to hand this across to you. Tell me what I'm handing. Tell them the, the good people what I just handed to you. 
Uh, slit my throat gently, a Michael Brett mystery. Okay, so the naked eye would say these are two guys writing in the same genre with the same name. It must be the same dude, but there are two different Michael Bretts. And that's their real name? No. Okay. Diecast is a pseudonym for someone else. I don't, I don't remember who it is. It wasn't a name I recognized. The other Michael Brett series that's in your hand is the real Michael Brett. He wrote a 10-book series starring Pete McGrath in the 1960s, and he was a regular contributor to Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine. So that's the real Michael Brett. It's a little confusing because uh, I think there's actually even maybe a third mystery writer from the same era who utilized the pseudonym Michael Brett. But the guy who wrote the Pete McGrath books was the actual Michael Brett, and the genu- it was a genuine article. And so but before he had this 10-book Pete McGrath series, Brett authored two crime novels, I'm going to hand these to you, starring a bald bookmaker named Stam Dackers. Both were published in 1959 as ace doubles, inconveniently not paired together, under the uh, name Mike Brett. Same guy, I promise. The first one was called Scream Street, and the second was called Guilty Bystander. And again, they've both been reprinted by Armchair Fiction as as doubles, but not with each other. So I'm reviewing uh, Guilty Bystander, which is actually the second book in the series. So the Sam Dackers, he's a sports bookmaker, a convicted felon, and a pretty funny first-person narrator. And so one night he meets a loopy chick in a bar and winds up at her place. Right as he's kind of closing the deal, her apartment buzzer goes um, and, and, and it starts uh, frantically buzzing. She says, it's probably just my violent mobster boyfriend. And so Sam heads for the fire escape. He basically has his pants around his ankles. He's working his way down the fire escape to the alley, and he hears gunshots from the girl's apartment. So we're dealing with a pretty basic and commonplace murder mystery set up here. Now, the cops suspect Sam, but the real killer is also trying to kill Sam, and Sam needs to save his hide by solving the case himself. Now, this dire setup doesn't prevent the author from thrusting Sam into several very comedic set pieces involving mistaken identity, sexy babe, stuff like that. It's nothing hilarious, but it was amusing. The central mystery is wrapped up tidily a little more than 100 pages later, and there's really no heavy lifting for the reader. Here's the thing with this book. Some books are fine dining. Others are cotton candy. The Guilty Bystander by Mike Brett is cotton candy. The writing is simple and straightforward. It's never flashy, but it is serviceable. The narrator was kind of a lovable oaf surrounded by archetypes you've you've seen before in better novels. Despite its lack of distinction, I really enjoyed this book. Um, I, it was an easy read. And it was a very quick read to pass the time before, but you know, between more substantial novels. Right. Because you know, sometimes cotton candy does the trick. Again, both of the Sam Dacker's novels have been reprinted as trade paperbacks by Armchair Fiction. Um, I enjoyed The Guilty Bystander enough that I got my hands on a copy of Scream Street, and I'm going to uh, actually read that and review it too, just because I, I genuinely enjoy The Guilty Bystander, but I want to control everyone's expectations that this will be on nobody's list of great works of mystery literature. All right, well, that concludes the 59th episode of the Paperback Warrior podcast. Join us every day at paperbackwarrior.com for daily reviews of vintage paperbacks, and we're going to see you next Monday for episode number 60. Have a great week. So long, everybody.